That's my notification. Hold on. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Judy Zicheng Wu. I'm the faculty director of the UCI Humanities Center and also professor of Asian American Studies. This year, the UCI Humanities Center has been exploring the theme of borders and belonging. This is a topic that's very much aligned with my own intellectual and personal and political interests. I think it's also a topic that is very much on our collective minds. If you can think back all the way to the beginning of the academic year in 2019, I think many of us were decrying the incarceration of refugee children at the borders of the United States. Today, at the end of the spring quarter 2020, we are here to honor the lives of African Americans who have died as a result of state violence and neglect during the time of COVID-19 pandemic. Our society is in deep turmoil and open division. This is due to irresponsible and divisive political leadership. It is due to the disproportionate impact of the global pandemic. And fundamentally, this is the result of ongoing systemic anti-Black violence that has been and continues to be openly sanctioned by those in power. I want to thank our three speakers today for joining us to help us understand and reflect on what we are collectively experiencing. Before I introduce them, I would just explain the format of our program. We received an overwhelming response of interest, and it really heartens me to know that there's so many of you who are concerned, outraged, um, want to be part of a community to, to talk about these issues. Um, this, when I last checked, we see over 900 RSVPs for a webinar room that only allows 500. So we are live streaming on the Humanity Center Facebook page. Everyone who RSVP has, been re has received this notification and you know others who want to participate or can't join us at this time, please check out our Facebook page now and also for the video afterwards. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function. For those who are watching on Facebook, please post a question on Facebook and we will try to monitor that page as well and address your questions. Our speakers today are Jessica Millward, 
an associate professor of history and the author of Finding Charity's Folk, en Enslaved and Free Black Women in Maryland, was published by the University of Georgia Press in 2015. Our second speaker is Sabrina Strings, associate professor of sociology and author of Fear Fearing the Black Body, The Racial Origins of Fat Phobia from New York University Press 2019. Our final speaker is Tiffany Willoughby Herbard, associate professor of African American Studies and the author of Waste of a White Skin, The Carnegie Corporation and the Racial Logic of White Vulnerability. I invite Tiffany to begin our event today with an evocation to Toni Morrison. It was Tiffany who suggested our title, Yonder They Do Not Love Your, Fre Your Flesh. This is a quote from Toni Morrison's Beloved, the 1993 novel that won the Bill Bell Prize and has been repeatedly been banned for its depiction of violence and sex as a fundamental condition of slavery. Tiffany. In this here place, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass, love it, love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just did soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pack them together. Stroke them on your face because they don't love that either. You got to love it. You. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leavens instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved. Feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support, shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your, lec your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck. Put a hand on it. Grace it. Stroke it and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs, you got to love them. The dark, dark liver, love it. Love it and the beat and beating heart, love that too. More than eyes or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air, more than your life holding womb and your life giving private parts. Hear me now, love your heart for this is the prize. Thank you so much, Tiffany. I'd like to begin with Jessica. In 2016, you wrote an essay entitled Black Women's History and the Labor of Mourning. Your essay begins by citing the statistic that Isabel Wilkerson noted. There was a lynching every four days in the early decades of the 20th century. A lynching every four days. It's been estimated that an African-American is now killed by police every two to three days. You go on to discuss how doing Black women's history inevitably involves the trauma of publicly mourning this violence. And I'd like to quote you at length. This article argues that contemporary violence against African Americans is influencing scholars to articulate a vocabulary that publicly acknowledge what, that we once kept quiet. And there's a psychological and sometimes physical cost associated producing monographs dedicated to African American pain. 
were labors of writing about haunted and hunted subjects, that is, African Americans in the face of sanctioned and unsanctioned violence, is producing a body of scholarship dedicated to grieving publicly, be it in the forms of op-eds or his tweets and his Facebook posts. Inevitably, this increased attention to the warning in shaping the field of African American women's history. By articulating the necessity to grieve and utilizing public spaces to mourn, African American women historians are shaping an academic discourse to help process the constant state of trauma that often accompanies our scholarly production. As I think about your insight, I realize that I'm once again asking you and the other people on the panel to do this work of helping us to collectively process trauma. It is painful yet incredibly necessary work. Could you share with us today how you have been processing the ongoing traumas of state sanctioned violence against African Americans, especially in this heightened context of fear and anxiety during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, that is not an easy task, but thank you for asking the question. Um, in this present moment, um, when so many African Americans are losing their lives once again to, to police violence, we can't help but think about mourning. Mourning as an act accompanies every aspect of African American history from slavery through its afterlife. And I have to admit that I don't have really my own words for, for this task you put before me. So what I am doing is I'm going to borrow from the words of other Black women of whom, whose shoulders I stand upon. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, Fanny Lou Hamer. Personally, I have been practicing self-care in order to process the anxiety and trauma linked first to COVID. By the time Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd were all murdered, I was already to borrow from Fannie Lou Hamer, sick and tired of being sick and tired. I won't speak for every Black person. I will just speak for those in my circle, who I speak with. We have been walking around in a spirit of mourning since 196, I'm sorry. We have been walking around in a spirit of mourning since 1619, when a woman named Angela disembarked on the shores of Virginia with 19 other Africans. We do not know what their fate would be, but we do know by the end of their lifetime, slavery had become permanent and inheritable through the womb of Black women. Angela Davis, she says, self-care and healing and attention to the body and the spiritual dimension, all of this is now part of radical social justice struggles. We must, as scholars, and as historians and uh, people in general committed to struggle, we must give ourselves permission to grieve. We grieve our, we give ourselves permissions to be angry. We give ourselves permission for radical self care, right? We can actually turn off the news. We don't need to always be current on the top news cycle or providing commentary to news stations unless we choose. I know that in my family, we found a way to survive and to give thanks daily for life because at this moment, life is very precious. Like many of my colleagues, I've been overtaxed with ensuring that my courses are up and running and that there is a safe space for my students. But there has been a limited um, amount of mental support for many frontline workers. And I will include educators, either by trade or circumstance, as all these people lift up the world. The third person I would like to invoke is the great Toni Morrison, who says, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There is no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. This is how civilizations heal. It's quite fortuitous that this program comes through the Humanities Center because I will say that the creative, um, creative aspect of the human character has really what has helped me process some of this. There have been truly epic battles on Instagram, DJ battles. We had the privilege, um, the world had the privilege of watching Miss Jill Scott and Erica Badu have a fabulous display of sisterhood a few weeks ago. Also on Instagram, Ruth Nicole Brown and Shamara Kwachi and other people involved in the Black Girl Genius Week um, sowed seeds of love into our hearts. And just re recently this week, a DJ by the name of Renee Soul played a um, online concert for the Kennedy Center. And finally, we as scholars, we as scholars, scholars like Callie Gross, Dinah Ramey Berry, Kelly Carter Jackson, and Sabrina Springs are all finding a way to produce in this moment as a way to guide people when they probably would like to do otherwise. 
And I would like to embrace the words of Jennifer Nash, who talks about uh, practicing love and Black feminism. A, a, a love politics should guide us. Finally, I leave you with the voices of two other people. The first is Asada Shakur, where she says in a very famous quote that is later picked up by Common in his song for Water for the Chocolate, Asada Shakur says, freedom. You asking me about freedom? Asking me about freedom? I'll be honest with you. I know a whole lot more about what freedom isn't than about what it is. So there are three very important words in my household. The first is love. My partner and I say, I got you, you got me. What else do we need? And we both follow up with freedom and justice. That is the takeaway. African descended people are still looking for freedom and justice. Take the British doctors who wanted to experiment on Africans for a cure to COVID. That is a great example of how black life still and has always been expendable, but not for those who love them. Be they lost to COVID or to state violence, the victims and their families still deserve justice to say nothing of freedom. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, and I'm still processing this, but I think the words are very important. I would be remiss if I did not utter the words of George Floyd's daughter, Gianna. When she was on the shoulders of former NBA player, Steven Jackson, he would, say, he would ask, what did, he did what? And Gianna was, responded back with, daddy changed the world. At what point will change come without Black people paying for it with their lives? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that incredibly moving um, sharing. Um, they think about teachers, scholars, artists as essential workers and the fundamental need that we have for love, love for each other. Um, I'd like to move on to Sabrina. On March 25th, you published an editorial in the New York Times entitled, It's Not Obesity, It's Slavery. We know why COVID-19 is killing so many Black people. In response to the question you wrote, to the question, why are Black people so sick? You answered slavery. And I wanted to quote you um, at length. The era of slavery was when white Americans determined that Black Americans needed only the bare necessities, not enough to keep them optimally safe uh, and healthy. It would set in motion people's diminished access to healthy foods, safe work conditions, medical treatment, and a host of other social inequalities that negatively impact health. Could you share with us today more of this insight about their life and the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on African Americans? Yes. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on these issues. I was actually looking forward to this panel largely as a way to process my own feelings um, and my own thoughts about what's been going on because of the fact that we are, for many of us who are fortunate enough, um, sheltering in place. Mm -hmm. This means that we don't have access to the same community to have these kinds of conversations that we might have under normal circumstances. So I find this to be very valuable, um, even for myself. Before I get to the points about healthcare and COVID-19, I actually want to begin with some comments about George Floyd, um, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, and the countless other Black people who have lost their lives to horrific and grotesque instances of police violence. Last summer, I was teaching a class, Social Inequalities, and I was doing a segment on policing. And there was a student in the class who started to cry copiously. And their response to the segments on policing in which we're noticing the fact that black people are disproportionately the victims of police violence and brutality. Uh, their response was, but there are good cops, there are good cops. And I'm sure many of us have heard this hundreds of times over the years. And my response was, we're not talking about individuals. It doesn't matter if there are good cops and bad cops. That's beside the point. The point is that there are structural inequalities that make it possible for police officers to view black people as disposable. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for us to keep in mind that when we consider how it is that black people are routinely the subject of police violence, that just like the overwhelming and disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on black communities, which I have located in slavery. Policing too 
comes out of slavery. We often think of slavery as just an economic institution that removed the right for our black people to have access to good jobs or to be paid for their labor. But slavery was also the moment in which policing cropped up in this country. All right, so many of us are unaware. And for that, I turn first to a quote from KRS One in the song Sound of the Police, in which he says the words overseer, 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 officer, to make it very clear the direct lineage between slavery and policing in the United States and who specifically is being targeted. There's also an NWA song, Express Yourself, in which they visually display how we have moved from black people being um, brutalized on plantations to black people being the disproportionate impacts or disproportionate victims of police violence, right? So for those of you who wonder if rap has a political message. If you're unfamiliar with the history of policing, Policing cropped up in the United States as an outgrowth of plantation owners' desire to make sure that black bodies had no place to be except for on the plantation. So they deputized individuals who we might loosely consider as bounty hunters to go around and find the black slaves who had escaped the plantation. Over time, there started to even be laws that were written such that after slavery, after this moment in which overseers and these sort of deputized individuals and vigilantes um, had largely either disbanded or been transmuted into institutionalized police forces. There were laws called black codes that stipulated where black people could go, how they could go, with whom, when, and if black people violated the law, the consequence was anything that was deemed necessary by the officers that found them. So keep that in mind. When we talk about the disproportionate violence that police officers are exacting on black people, we have to keep in mind that there were literal laws in place that made it possible for police to legally brutalize black people when they saw fit, when they thought they were out of line in any fashion. And it's important that we think about this history because as I was talking about um, in the piece that you mentioned, there is this lineage from slavery that it's all too easy for, to forget when we're looking at the outcomes in the black community, right? When we talk about police outcomes rooted in slavery. When we talk about health outcomes, it's easy to forget that black people were given just the basic minimum of things needed to survive. Basic shelter, basic food, just enough water, not enough to be optimally safe and healthy. Because the belief was that black people were laboring bodies, they were property, they were commodities, and all that we need to do is make sure that they are functional, not that they are healthy, not that they are safe, not that they are happy. And therefore, we have it, the possibility that black people who are being victims of a system are treated as if they are responsible for the system, right? So we have claims that it's obesity, that's killing black people, in which there's very little evidence of that. Whereas there's copious evidence that it's the lack of health care that is detrimental to black people's health outcomes. So when we think about claims about obesity, just like claims about George Floyd having a counterfeit bill, right? All of these claims are constantly trying to locate the problem on the black body and black people's actions. When in reality, we need to keep in mind that disproportionate violence that is being visited upon African Americans has a long trajectory in this country, and we're not going to be able to address either the disproportionate health outcomes, the negative health outcomes amongst Black people, or the disproportionate violence against Black bodies without first addressing the history and legacy of slavery. Thank you so much, Sabrina. As you were talking, I just saw a Facebook posting saying that this history of policing needs to be mandatory education for all of us. I would agree. <laughs> Thank you for that. I'd like to turn next to Tiffany. In 2017, you received the May C. King Distinguished Paper Award on Women, Gender, and Black Politics for your paper. Um, and there's different parentheses, I'm just going to say without them, uh, political anesthesia or political memory, the Kambahi River Collective and the death of Black women in custody. It was presented at the 2016 Annual Meeting of the American Political Science Association, and the essay was subsequently published in a special issue of Theory and Event that you co-edited with a former UCI graduate student, Shadi Milaku. Um, the issue was dedicated to Afro-pessimism and Black feminism. Your paper focuses on the murder of Black women during police stops and while in custody, 
and urged us to think, rethink the policy vocabulary that typically defines such murders as good kill and within policy. You theorize that such normalized violence reflects the fundamental relationship between Black women and the state and the society. You describe this political order as a slave polity whose long reliance on biomedical racialization and the medical plantation. In your paper, you draw from the 1977 Black Feminist Combat He River Collective Statement to define slave polity as the uniquely modern slave polity that passed slave status on from generation to generation to the line of the mother and that reinforced slave status to the normalized breeding of Black women for sexualized punishment to extend the life of the whitened political order. The slave polity also relied on painful human experimentation on Black women and their reproductive organs, thereby doubling Sexual, sexualizing the non-consensual extraction of new knowledge and new science on their bodies. Consideration of the, heavy, the history of violence against Black women under slavery goes a very long way to help us understand how we have arrived at the present moment. Could you elaborate on how these insights help us understand the racialized and gender, gendered violence directed towards African women as well as African American men in the present moment? Hmm. Thank you so much. Um, what I want to direct um, our attention to is uh, a section in that meditation that you just referred to, um, where I engage with um, a novel by Austin Clark called The Polished Ho. And Clark describes um, what it is like to be um, to be a confessor as an adult Black woman who has to tell the history of both medicalization and sexualization um, in the life of a Black community. So if I can um, build upon what my colleagues have offered thus far, um, what Austin Clark renders and unpacks is the kind of stories that uh, Black women are walking around with in their bodies, um, that Black trans people are walking around with in their bodies, that Black gender non-binary people are walking around with in their bodies, that Black children are walking around with in their bodies, that Black elders are walking around with in their bodies, that Black men are walking around with in their bodies of being um, touched and manhandled and physically assaulted um, by both the state and also within the household allegedly to protect them from the state. So that's what I can say about that, but I have, some, I have something else to add. <laughs> and it's a series of questions about what if I cannot represent or translate or soothe? What if I have no advisement about what is to be done? What if I refuse to represent my community, but instead in this moment attend to my own singular heart and soul? What if I simply marvel at the birth pangs of this generation? Generations that are getting shorter and shorter between as time collapses that generation that birthed themselves through remembering Ray Marley Graham, and that generation that came of age while despairing over Amadou Diallo, and that generation that came into its awareness and its mindfulness through remembering Corinne Gaines and Wakisha Wilson and Sandra Bland and Tony McDade, generations all stitched together. What if I say, What's happening in the streets is illegible and not supposed to be understood and absolutely logical. What if I say it's full of traces and patterns, but I publicly refuse to share those patterns with you because this is your work to do on the things that you can see and know, but refuse to see and know. What if I say this is not about saving America or helping the beneficiaries of white privilege recover their souls? What if I say we don't pray to the same God and we don't bleed the same? What if I say this is not over? 
What if I say this has nothing to do with vengeance, but instead has to do with a thing that cannot be made better? What if I say this is what love looks like? Taking the ugly names, doing the bitter work, chewing up this history and consuming this way of being and becoming the boogeyman that we are always alleged to be. What if when I do what is happening in these streets right now, I'm showing you what it means to be loved. Right now, my students, our students are walking around with bullets in their legs, in their arms, in their faces, in their flesh, and hundreds of good people came to look and see and be told that this will all be just fine. It will not be just fine. <laughs> it will not work out. This system is designed to work this way. And as long as the system's reason for living is eating me, I will refuse. I get to feel, and as long as it takes for me to make sense of what this means for me as a living person in the world, I get to take that time. So like others, I condemn the police and vigilante killings, but I also condemn the state officials who have dishonored their memory and done their utmost to signal that even in death, our people are under suspicion and not deserving of unconditional love. To all of us who grieve them and call for accountability and justice in their names, who have been beaten, mocked, shot at, driven over, and killed, I need to say that these are simply more reminders of how white supremacy, state and vigilante killings, and punitive policies work to end us. While the president has encouraged gun violence in the face of national civil disobedience and mass demonstrations that were a proper, necessary, appropriate, love-filled, and good way to respond to conditions of racial terror, we are being told that we cannot love other Black people because they didn't do it in the right way. I will love all of me. I will love all of my Blackness. And no one gets to tell me that I don't get to love all Black people. And business will continue to be interrupted until all of our people can move through this society without being accosted, brutalized, and blamed. We will not be shamed into disavowing our own. That was amazing, Tiffany. Thank you so much. I want to open the, the floor to people who are watching, who are listening, and ask if you would like to ask us questions. Please feel free to post questions in the Q&A. While we're waiting for those, Jessica, I could tell you were doing the finger snap. Is there anything deserve, we, I mean, this panel deserves the finger snap across the board. <laughs> that deserved the fin finger snap, the honesty, the, the, the honesty, the ability to be raw and vulnerable. Um, you deserve the finger snap on that one, Tiffany. Thank you. Absolutely. I just, um, there's a comment from the audience um, from Candace Burton. I just wanted to say that gave me back some of my life, life in all capitals. Um, from Sarah and Efren, thank you all so much for all that you shared. Another praise, I don't have questions, just wanna say thank you, Jessica, Tiffany, and Sabrina. Aryan Safai.
Um, no questions, just love, deep respect, solidarity with you, oh Sammy. I was wondering if you wanted to, since we're receiving all this praise, <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you wanted to say anything to each other based on what you've shared with us today. I love, Jessica, the way that you brought in all of the, um, the people on whose shoulders that we stand. Um, I thought that was really powerful, particularly because the kind of work that we do um, doesn't get cited or engaged with um, in substantive fashion. And, you know, like you alluded to, uh, Sabrina, folks, as you actually share the work, are busy trying to take the words out of your mouth and tell you that you shouldn't be sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard an echo in between those two. Hmm. I have a couple of questions, but I didn't know if anybody else wanted to speak first before I asked them. Uh, may I? May I? <laughs> yes, of course. First of all, thank you for um, giving this platform. Um, there's been many requests, I believe, on all of our time um, in terms of, of making it right for other people, speaking about anti-racism in the, in the um, academy for other people. There's been a lot of requests. Let me say it again, a lot of requests to make this moment tangible, tangible and okay for other people. And there's a meme that's going around that's basically, your black friends are not okay, okay? We are, we are not okay. And um, maybe we can post access to it. But I, I think that inherently you understood when you asked us to do this panel, we might not be okay. And so it might be a little different and you were open to those suggestions, Judy, so thank you. Um, Tiffany Willie Burrard, I have nothing but love for you. Um, she is my um, comrade in so many different battles <laughs> on the ground and in the academy. I, may, I, have, I have nothing to say, nothing but love. Sabrina, you do not understand the weight you just lifted by doing a mini lecture on slavery. Thank you for doing that so I didn't have to carry that. Thank you for speaking out in this moment when so many of us are rendered speechless. I'm sorry the labor had to fall on you, but we are so, so grateful. Thank you. And I'll also say, I just feel so honored to be a part of this panel. Um, I've often come to Tiffany <laughs> in times of distress, um, which she is well aware, and I really appreciate her, appreciated her being the kind of person that I can lean on. And I think that the vulnerability that she showed today in the panel was necessary for all of us. Um, and Jessica, to you, I just really appreciated um, the beautiful offerings um, of all of the many ancestors, the sort of powerful Black women who we often maybe think about or maybe even talk about amongst ourselves, but that many people in our community have limited access to. They're not taught their work. They're not respected. And so it's so important to bring them into the conversation at a time like this. I thought that was extremely valuable. And the other thing I wanna say about this panel is that I'm so glad that so far this panel hasn't been about how do we fix it? Uh, it's so frequent that I've been invited to speak on these issues and people have sort of wanted to jump ahead to the solution. Well, how do black people fix this? It's not on black people's shoulders to fix this. It's on the entire community of the United States to fix this. This is an American problem that's been going on for hundreds of years. And we're not going to solve it in an hour. It requires years and years of work and conversations and the willingness to put in the effort. So I just feel pleased that today is an opportunity for us to simply testify and to explain the significance of our ancestors and not try to tell people what they need to do to fix it. Thank you to all of you. I have several questions now, and I may not be able to get through all of them, but I'll just maybe begin with one on the Q&A, then I'll also go to the Facebook questions. Do you have a book you can, we can read or recommend on the history of police as an institution? That's a great question. You know, one of my friends who is a criminologist, I've asked her that question, and surprise, surprise, she doesn't even know of one. Um, the issue is that what we're dealing with are the kinds of histories that are meant to be hidden. 
And so it's difficult to even find data on contemporary policing, um, which many people have talked about. If you wanna find data on police activities right now, you might go to places like the Sentencing Project or We Charge Genocide, but outside of that, to find a compendium of how the police have been attacking people of color in their communities over the many decades that we've been describing, I don't know of a book on that, unfortunately. Um, however, if you want to read up on some of the more, I suppose, some type of history about this, you can turn to um, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. That's one resource. But otherwise, you're going to have to do your own research and digging to get this information. And I would, I would add that um, it's, it, as great as I'm, I'm looking at some of the, the, the chats that we're having, um, online is gender and the new Jim Crow. Uh, Tiffany just put up Sarah Haley's um, book, No Mercy Here, Gender and Punishment. Talitha, uh, uh, Talitha LaFloria, who also works on um, carcerality in, in Georgia. Um, the work of Callie Gross, the work of Heather Thompson in some forms. Um, I guess my answer would be as much as scholarship is very, very important, and, and I encourage everyone to read more on it. This is a moment where you don't actually need to go to the library. You just need to turn on the news and watch news with a different lens, okay? You just have to turn on the news. Um, and then you go to books for a history. Then you go to um, political scientists or sociologists for these charts and these graphs. I will also add um, three other books. <laughs> three other books. I would be remiss if I didn't. Uh, Ruthie Gilmore's Golden Gulag. If you know Ru Ruthie Gilmore is a scholar and an activist, we can only thank her for, gener for, for, for educating many of us for generations. We have in our own history department, um, a young man by the name of Max Spears, who's working on the history of policing that comes out of slavery. So the, the dissertation is in progress. Um, and now I see that there's more and more on the feed, more and more titles are, are, are being spoken about, including one, um, uh, Damien Sojourner, another colleague of ours, First Strike, Educational Enclosures in Black Los Angeles. Um, that was, thank you to Tiffany for giving me some of that script. Thank you. <laughs> Let me unmute myself. So I want to really highlight um, Sojourner's book, The First Strike One, um, because it does this really important work of talking about not just the, the prison or the jail um, or the immigration detention center on its own. It does this really incredible work of talking about carcerality in all of our institutions, right? So the way that carcerality shows up in all of these kinds of places and in the ways that we mishandle, mischaracterize and abuse um, people and you know, he makes this really subtle shift from the argument about the school to prison pipeline. He shifts from that to talking about the way that our entire society is lined with carcerality, with trying to um, create um, and re reinforce captivity for black people all over the place. I also wanted to call out um, Push Out by Monique Morris which has a very specific focus on black girls and the ways that schools create captivity for them and hypersexualizes them. So we do a kind of disservice to our kids when we're telling them just keep going to school, just keep going to school when the school is actually treating them as if they're caged. Thank you so much for these valuable suggestions for readings. And I love the fact that the history professor is telling people to turn on the television. Um, a question from Facebook. So one of the things that I've been pondering about over the last few days is regarding the differences in generations. How do you suggest, and I realize this is one of those questions, how do we fix things, but how do you suggest younger generations having conversations with their parents, um, especially when they don't see eye to eye? And for this particular person, um, he said, I'd start conversations with, quote, what differences do you see in society today versus when you grew up?
I will just tell the, this person that I, I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. Um, I do not have the answer, but what I will tell you, and I don't want to be too Pollyanna about this. Um, so I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah, as is my father. And I've kind of been very numb about this entire, everything, the last two weeks. I've been very numb until I saw protest on the state capitol of Salt Lake City, Utah, where a multiracial crowd was uh, saying Black Lives Matter. And I was with my dad and we looked at each other and said, did you ever think in our lifetime you would ever see anything about black people mattering in this state that is quite historically racist? And he said, no. So there's no moral, I have no moral, I have no uh, advice because I have this, this problem in my own interpersonal relationships into talking to people um, in my family. I will say that though, don't waste your time on trying to change minds of people who aren't going to be converted. Um, it does you a particular kind of damage. Your job is not to change uh, the minds of everyone. If you wanna broach a conversation, you can do it the way we do in class and start with kind of, there's going to be rules about conduct that rarely works with family. Um, so I think one of the things that is good to do, and I know I'm rambling as I work out this thought, is that showing is better than telling. You can actually, show and lead by example sometimes better than you can actually have a conversation with people. I don't know if that answered the question. It's just kind of gave voice to some of the things I have to navigate between um, being both a professor and then actually a family member with people who might not share my beliefs. This is a baby sock. This is a baby sock and I was doing some cleaning in my house this week and moved behind a bookcase and I found a baby sock. People who are in your family have a different relationship to you um, because they might know things about you like about when you were this size. And as you grow and you develop, they may not be able to accommodate your changing ideas. It may be really, really hard for them. But one of the greatest gifts that you can give the people that you share biological ties with is you can welcome them into spaces where you are sharing ideas with people um, that maybe represent who you're trying to become and who you want to become. I don't think you have to do it on your own. I don't think you have to be the one lone person um, having the conversation with your family members. Um, one of the kind of unseen and unevenly experienced hardship, but also perhaps benefits of having to be cited at home for us during COVID is perhaps your siblings and your parents are hearing you talk about the things that you're studying. And perhaps it has created an opportunity for you to have some of those painful, um, difficult, maybe even shaming and humiliating conversations when people show themselves to you and you realize that they want you to survive, but they don't care about other people who look like you. Or they want uh, your group of people to survive, but not any other groups of people to survive. Um, so I, I would strongly say use the fact of something like this ha happening and, you know, I went to this thing one time, you know, there's these rhetorical strategies. You know, some people have the idea that it doesn't have to be yours. You don't have to stand on it as an object of conviction for you. You can introduce it rhetorically as somebody else's idea if that makes it more possible for you to be in a conversation with people that you care about. But I have to really echo also the thing um, that Dr. Milward just said. It's not an information problem. It's a terrorism problem. It's a violence problem, right? It's not that the folks in your family don't know that they're saying stuff that's objectionable. They know. It's not a microaggression. When people say stuff that's really inappropriate, they're trying to police you into believing things that they think you should believe. Mm -hmm. And if they will police you around how you understand the humanity and the dignity of other people, 
Best believe they will police you about other areas of your own life too. So you're not just standing up for other people, you're actually standing up for your own voice and your own value by saying, I don't agree, or whoo, ow, that hurts. That hurts, I don't, where'd you come up with that? Mm. Here's a book. <laughs> now we go back to books. <laughs> You know, I think for me, as difficult as it may sound, I would encourage people to actually listen to their relatives. Um, this is a lesson that I've had in my own life, which is that, you know, especially coming through undergraduate, you know, a lot of us have the undergraduate awakening of like all yeah. of the social issues that are going on. And then you take it back to your family and be like, look at all this. And of course, they're looking at you like, be quiet. Uh, like, because what you sometimes have the tendency to do is like, you've learned something and then you want to bludgeon someone with it. And that's really not how understanding takes place. Even if you think they are incorrect, it would be extremely valuable for you just to sit and have a conversation in which you don't imagine that you're teaching them, but that you're learning from one another. They're going to try to explain to the best of their ability, if you create those conditions, how it is that they hold these views that you may even view as bigoted but just let them talk about it and then ask them questions. And then you can respond with, if you can, some type of patience and just listening, right? So that instead of trying to think about a situation in which you are getting them on your side, you are creating the conditions for a dialogue with the people that you love. Now, this doesn't mean that at the end of the conversation, they're going to agree with you on all your points but it at least creates the space for you to try to see one another eye to eye, as opposed to coming into an arena as combatants. Thanks to all of you. Um, I was thinking about this in relation to my own life, that I have children who are teenagers in their teens, and then I have parents who, or my father recently passed away, but my mother just turned 80. And to think about how to have these conversations across generations um, is very difficult, but it's so necessary. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time, and I apologize to everybody who's asked questions and we're not able to address. But I think I want to evoke what our panelists have been sharing, that this is a very difficult issue that we can't solve, not right now, but that we eventually hope to in some way. And I, so I hope that we can continue the conversation beyond this one event. I'll just ask this last question, and then um, we'll, we have a couple of things that we want to do before we close. And it's actually a combination of, of questions. One is um, from Elizabeth Rubio. Um, thanks so, to you. Thank you so much, all. I'm wondering what are some principles we as educators can follow as we try to provide a space for students to take pause, to grieve, but also provide frameworks to actively process this momentous time of uprising. And I'd like to couple that with another question by um, Jairus Pacello. As students in higher education academia, especially in the humanities like gender and sexuality studies, African American studies, Asian American studies, what advice would you give us to help in, mo in movement building and liberation, especially at this moment? I have advice, but I think it's going to be wrapped up in, in, in my closing words. I, I will just um, tell all the, the, particularly the university age students out there, um, thank you so much for your work on the front lines. Every good revolution needs um, people with your energy and your insight and just continue um, pushing forward and um, talk to one another. I guess take Sabrina's advice talk to one another, hear one another, because even within this particular moment, um, it, while people are protesting, there are diverse opinions and not everyone is agreeing on, on what the plan should be. I know, again, Pollyanna-ish, there's also a time where that just won't work. But the adv best advice I can give you is that, particularly for you all, you are armed with certain skills that um, other people might, might not be armed with. And so now it's your, your time to go and be that architect of a new civilization. You now get to practice being a citizen of the world and take what we have given you and go out and, and, and build on it. Yeah, I think to that I'd like to say, um, 
it's true. I mean, it's like when we're trying to create a dialogue, that's one strategy, but it's definitely not the only, only strategy. And it doesn't work in all instances. Um, and largely we hope that it will work with those individuals with whom you share a loving space. But if you don't share a loving space, dialogue may not be possible. Right. And so for that reason, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that we don't know all of what it's going to take in what will inevitably be a years long effort to actually try to change the structure of the United States. This is not just about policing and it's not just about healthcare. Every one of the social institutions that we are familiar with are led by white persons. They may or may not have white supremacist views, but we cannot deny the fact that there's not a single institution in the United States that's led by white people. This means that we have a long way to go in order to make power sharing possible, to make the voices of people, people of color heard, to incorporate gender non-binary folks. There are so many different things that we need to do. And what that requires us, what that requires of us in this time is to be like fugitives. We don't know what's next, but we need to be willing to put in the effort to shape shift and move and to respond to the situation in the ways that we can at the times in which it is required. I love that shape shift and move. Mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of that Kate Russian uh, quote, stretch or die. You know, I, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, Judy, um, about your dad. I didn't realize he had actually made his transition. Um, I believe in writing like I believe in God. Um, I think there's just so much work that's happening on social media and folks talking to each other. You know, one of the things that um, a lot of people, I've heard all these wonderful young people be interviewed, talking about um, what their communication is like now and how, how we kind of have been, uh, people my generation have been underestimating um, the quality of conversation and the quality of thought that's happening among people in the generation after because it's happening through social media. And that is a real mistake and it's a real overlooking, it's a real um, uh, cruelty. It's just a real misstep because uh, you all not only share images with each other, but you also write to each other. You have knocked down, drag out uh, writing festivals 30, 40, 50 times a day. At least that's what the evidence that social media scholars share with us. So I want you to trust your writing to each other and trust that some of the work is actually already happening because you all are writing to each other. Um, trust that. Trust that you're really shifting narratives. You really, really are. Um, they may tell us that what we're doing is thuggish, is petty, is violent, and doesn't matter. But what you're doing is love. You're actually loving each other and loving us in ways that we haven't been loved before. So thank you. Thank you for everything that all of us is doing, but especially the people who are walking around having been tear gassed and having bullets in their bodies. Thank you, Tiffany, um, for everything. Every time I hear you speak, I just feel so blown away by everything that you share with us. Um, I wanted to thank the people who've been helping to organize this event. There's a lot of hidden labor behind this event, and especially want to acknowledge Amanda Swain, Saeed Jalapur, um, Juhun Singh, who are the faculty, or sorry, the staff of the Humanity Center, and there's many other people I want to thank. Um, but in the interest of time, it's just a big hug, and thank you to all of you, I won't name you specifically. Our speakers today remind us of this long, deep, and brutal history of anti-Black violence, and how we need to collectively mourn and bear witness and engage in love. COVID-19 is making it more apparent how we are not all in this together, um, but that we might do the difficult work of valuing each other's lives. And as part of this effort, I know some of you are engaging in protest, talking to your family and friends, writing statements, issuing statements, and contacting elected officials. So today I'm asking you to do one more thing. I'm asking if you can complete the US Census. Um, I'm gonna start a poll now. Uh, we'll do it very quickly. 
and I just want to know if you've completed the census. The reason I'm asking is that UCI has only a 52.8 completion rate, so just over one in two people have responded. This is lower than the national average of 60%, basically, and the state average is 62%. The last time the U.S. Census was taken, UCI was officially designated as undercounted. The groups that tend to be undercounted are reflected in our student population. People of color, people with low incomes, people experiencing housing insecurity, people with disabilities, LGBTQ folks, people who are immigrants, people who are undocumented, people who are young. So we're on our way to being undercounted again as a result of the pandemic, which has disrupted um, many of our lives. So why does the census matter? This is how the government allocates funding for schools, for healthcare, for road repair, even water allocation. This is how the state appropriates congressional representation. So it's an avenue to political access and political power. So if UCI and other communities are undercounted, we will continue to be underserved. Um, I'm just curious to see what the poll results are. Um, Saeed, if you could show that. Um, so, if you have not responded yet, please do so. Oh, we're just starting the poll now. So please, um, to please answer. Um, if you haven't responded, please do so. There's a link in the poll as where you can get access to that. And please tell your friends and family, it's absolutely essential. This is how we advocate for ourselves and our communities. While the poll is running, Jessica, I'm gonna turn this over to you to clean, close this out. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. Um, in the interest of time, I was going to um, shorten a poem by Asada Shakur, but I feel that Black women so rarely get the stage that I'm going to read all of these words that comes from the autobiography of Asada Shakur, and it's called The Tradition. Carry it on now, carry it on. Carry it on now, carry it on. Carry on the tradition. There were black people since the childhood of time who carried it on. In Ghana and Mali and Timbuktu, we carried it on. Carry on the tradition. We, hood in, we hid in the bush when the slave masters came, holding spears, and when the moment was ripe, leaped and lanced the lifeblood of would-be masters. We carried it on. On slave ships, hurling ourselves into oceans, slitting the throats of our captors, we took their whips and their ships. Blood flowed into the Atlantic and it wasn't all ours. We carried it on. Fed Missy arsenic apple pies, stole the axes from the shed, went and chopped off master's head. We ran, we fought, we organized a railroad and underground. We carried it on. In newspapers, in meetings, in arguments and street fights, we carried it on. In tales told to children, in chants, in kanadas, in poems and blues songs and saxophone screams, we carried it on in classrooms, in churches, in courtrooms, in prisons. We carried it on, on soapboxes and picket lines, welfare lines, and employment lines. Our lives on the line, we carried it on. In sit-ins and pray-ins and march-ins and die-ins, we carried it on. On cold Missouri midnights, pitting shotguns against lynch mobs, on burning Brooklyn streets, pitting rocks against rifles, we carried it on against water hoses and bulldogs, against nightsticks and bullets, against tanks and tear gas, needles and nooses, bombs and birth control. We carried it on in Selma and San Juan, Mozambique, Mississippi, in Brazil and Boston. We carried it on through the lies and the sellouts, the mistakes and the madness, through pain and hunger and frustration. We carried it on carried on the tradition, carried a strong tradition, carried a proud tradition, carried a black tradition, carry it on. Pass it down to the children. Pass it down, carry it on, carry it on now, carry it on to freedom. Thank you. Ashe. Ashe. Okay.